No, you're not. Not what? You're not rolling on the floor laughing. Why would you lie about that? That's what that means? I thought it meant really obscene fart laugh. No, it doesn't. Wait. Did you? <laughs> Good morning. So which one of those most closely resembles your laugh? Anybody here have an embarrassing laugh? Uh, good to be with you this morning. Whew. So, good morning. There's one awake. Awesome. All right, sorry, I forgot to announce. It's Malachi. Everybody should stand up. The house gets crazy. Malachi Cecino, everybody. Uh, uh, Oh, so good. It is awesome to be here. Today we're talking about finances. And uh, so just for future reference, when Daniel says, hey, I need you to do something for me, ask him what he wants before you say yes. <laughs> can anybody else here relate to that? <laughs> okay, there's one. Yeah, I bet you can. Finances. Hmm. Be a sixer. These six areas of really being alive and living to our full potential in Jesus Christ. First thing I want to do is dispel a lie of Satan that we need dispelled, I do at least, like every day. We do not do good enough to get to God so that we can be blessed. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus emptied himself, became a man, and became obedient to death, even death on a cross, for you and me. I can tell you from experience, and you can probably relate to this, Jesus meets you right where you are. Wherever you are today, in these six areas, he is right here, ready to help you. Talking about finances is another area of our lives where God wants to set us free. He wants to bless us. He wants to teach us and increase our faith. Face it, we're all good Americans, right? I don't know if you're like me, but when God has my money, he really has me. So, finances. Before I dig in, a couple of things. One, I don't know if you're tempted to this, but when I meet people, I usually look at them and make a first impression. Anybody else here struggle with that, right? You size them up, put them into a category, right? Faux hawk dude with a beard that's a preacher. <laughs> There's a category for that. So you're looking at me, and you're like, okay, yuppie, 40-something, still wearing buckle shirts, and he <laughs> irons pleats in his jeans. Metrosexual is what we were thinking. Metrosexual, <laughs> yes, yes, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, take, exactly. You've probably heard this saying, everybody's normal until you get to know them. <laughs> it's true. Um, I am a recovering alcoholic and drug addict. And I have eight going on nine years of sobriety. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. Amen. That's my longest run by far. I've struggled with alcohol and drug addiction since I was 11 and 12 years old. Um, I have relapsed multiple times. I have walked with the Lord and thought I was over it, only to find myself back in it again, sometimes even lower than last time. Eight years ago, God finally got me to a spot where I was so low and so desperate that I was really willing to surrender, to truly surrender. 
Uh, our marriage was what we now call the emergency room. I'd been unfaithful to my wife. I'd been in secret sin. I'd been drinking. I'd been living a double life. Our finances were absolutely destroyed. And one of the best ways to give you a picture of where I was at, like, I couldn't even lift my head up. Like, I'd be working, and I'd just have my head down. And I was, I am so down. I'm so ashamed. I'm just so low. I can't even lift my head up. And the Lord spoke to me, and he gave me a picture, which is kind of weird, but it was a power cord coming out of me with a plug on the end. And he took his hand and he unplugged the cord from the wall and he set it on the ground. And he said, Malachi, you have spent your whole life mostly plugged into your own power. I have gifted you. I've given you abilities, a calling, and you've been running on your own strength and your life has been an absolute disaster. So we're going to leave that cord right there for a while. And when I plug you back in, you're going to be plugged into my power source. And I am going to be empowering who I made you to be. And it's going to be a completely different, beautiful thing. And he has done that. Um, one of the biggest testimonies is my marriage with my wife. We still bear the scars of my bad choices. And we're still building trust. And wounds are there. And healing is happening. But when I look into my wife's eyes, I see love. And I never thought I was going to see love in her eyes again. I thought it was impossible that that woman would forgive me again. And we would actually be made whole. But God can do anything. Come on, Jesus. Come on, Jesus. He has restored our marriage to a level that is literally miraculous. We should have declared bankruptcy. If you were to come into our situation, you would have said, declare bankruptcy. Duh. We chose not to, worked out our debts, and chunked them out over time, and eventually got them all paid off. <laughs> and God has us here, <laughs> which is crazy. <laughs> Talking to you guys. <laughs> so here we are. How did, how did I get here? I don't go to your church. <laughs> <laughs> Kathy and I, Sage Hills Church is our home church and has been for a long time. We love Sage Hills. That's, that's where we worship. That's our home church family. But I'll tell you something. You are our church family too because there is one body of Christ. And it knows no boundaries, it knows no buildings, it knows no titles. We are one. And so when you start saying yes to Jesus, you hear nothing else today. Hear this. God is looking for your next yes. God is looking for your next yes. When you say yes to Jesus, you find yourself in crazy places like speaking in front of a church that you're partnered with that you don't even go to. <laughs> <laughs> so how do we get here? Two years ago, we came to a Christmas Eve service here at Awaken, first time ever. And my awesome wife is nostalgic, and she wanted to go to Christmas Eve service on Christmas Eve. And there wasn't any Christmas Eve service at our church, so we came here. And God impacted us. We could, we could sense the spirit. We could feel God moving in this place. And, and uh, we saw a couple people that were here that we were like, what are they doing here? <laughs> I never, never thought I'd see them in church. You guys ever seen somebody in church? You're like, whoa. <laughs> I've never, never thought I'd see them in church. Awesome. We talked to them. We knew God is moving. God is, God is bringing the lost to be found, Amen. saved and set free by the power of Jesus in this place. And it impacted us. We're like, hmm, I wonder, wonder what that means. Careful. 
Careful what you ask God, right? He is a good, good father. Amen. Amen. Through circumstances, we ended up connecting um, with, I ended up connecting with Ross and Daniel. And I, something I want you to understand in this story, your church leadership never came and asked us to help. God told us to help this church. And that's powerful. It's a powerful thing. So we start interacting with them. We meet a couple times, and, th and at that time, your church was looking at the Skookum Plaza, possibly being in part of that building. And I thought, well, maybe um, we own a contracting company. I thought maybe we're supposed to you know, help with some engineering services, just help give wisdom, see if this is a building that's going to pencil to build in. So we did some pre-engineering, figured out there was some structural issues, and that wasn't the spot. And as we're going through this process, I'm getting to know these brothers better and their hearts and this church. And God ends up with your church swirling down on this opportunity at the bottom of Fifth Street, the old ice rink. And at that point, I'm mean, just telling Kathy, we got to pray. I feel like maybe we're supposed to step into something more here. I don't know. And so we're praying about it. And God gave us a specific word. And that word was, do whatever it takes to get awakened into that new building. And I, I didn't, we didn't know what that meant. And I could tell you something. I still don't fully know <laughs> what that means. I still e don't, we don't even know how much that costs yet. You know, he spoke we prayed about it, and we're like, yeah, I think we're, sp I, I think we're supposed to say, we'll do whatever it takes to help you get into your new building. <laughs> okay. So we schedule, we're going to meet, uh, Ross Daniel and I are going to meet at Cafe Mela, and um, this, is, this is really cool. We decided, yes, we're, we hear you, Lord, we will say yes. The day before we're going to meet for coffee, and I'm going to tell them, tell these guys this, which is awesome. It's so cool when you obey the Lord, and then you, like, say something just nuts like that, and they're just like, like, what do you do with that? It's like, God does stuff that there's no category for. So it's the day before. I'm, uh, you got to understand a um, little backstory. I, our company had done a lot of work for this very large company that was growing very fast. We did a ton of work all around the region, and they owed me a huge amount of money. And it had been a year since they paid us. And I'd met with their CEO, and we had talk, tried to talk through how they were going to tackle this debt. And I was beginning to think they were never going to pay it. It was looking like they were never going to be able to pay it. So I'm like, man, what? You know, you've got this word, right? And then you've got this circumstance that does not match the word. <laughs> I'm like, if they don't pay that bill, that's a year of work and all that material. I mean, a huge amount of money. Uh, how do these even coincide? We agreed and we decided the day before we're set to meet at Cafe Mela, I get it. I'm, I'm on a uh, field trip with our third daughter. And I get an email from my, no, a text. I get a text from my office manager. And it's a picture of a check for the from that company for the total amount that they owed us. Yeah. And I forwarded that to Kathy. And I'm just like, holy crap. <laughs> Can you, <laughs> if we needed a confirmation, I mean, there it was. And we have stepped in, and I mean, it has taken longer than we thought it would. It's cost more than I guessed it would, and we still, we're still not done. We're close, <laughs> but we're not done. And, and here we are with this gap between how much money we have and how much money is needed. And God is teaching powerful lessons in this space. Something that happened recently to me that I want to share with you. Uh, anybody here ever doubt? <laughs> Raise your hand if you ever doubt. Okay. 
Yeah, like all of us. You have a pulse, you doubt, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> Except Falaki. She, you're doubt light, right? <laughs> so uh, not very long ago, <laughs> I was starting to doubt. Because like, we, I had this idea of what it was going to cost, and we're about double that now. And I'm like, Lord, where is this going to come from? And he's given me, he's given me assurance that one way or another, he's going to take care of it. And I started doubting. And the scripture came to my mind. Question. Does Satan use God's own words to mess you up sometimes? Yeah. Yes, he will. He tried it on Jesus himself in the desert. So if he's got the guts to try to do it to God himself, he will do it to you. So I'm starting to doubt. And then here's the scripture from Luke chapter 14 that popped into my head. Don't, but don't begin until you count the cost. For who would begin construction of a building without first calculating the cost to see if there is enough money to finish it? <laughs> God's word said, says, test every spirit to determine if it's from the Lord. You hear something like this and there is doubt and fear accompanied with it, I can almost guarantee you that is not from the Lord. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. That is the spirit of God. You see, you hear how confident I'm right now? <laughs> when that popped into my head, I was slightly less confident. <laughs> I'm like, mm, man, that sounds kind of familiar. Okay, uh, so I have a word, a piece of God's word accompanied with doubt and fear. What do I do? Take it to the Lord in prayer. Lord, speak to me. What, what do you want me to hear? Speak for your servant is listening. And he brought to my mind the story about King David from the Old Testament that I really couldn't remember where David says, I will not offer a sacrifice that costs me nothing. And I'm like, okay, that's, that's comforting. But God also says, when you hear a word, go to the word and read the word so you can see the context of the word, so that you can understand it and make sure you're not misapplying his truth. So I'm like, okay, well, I should go to the word and see what that story was. And I, found, I ended up in First Chronicles chapter 21. And here's the story that surrounds that message. Satan rose up against Israel and caused David to take a census of the people of Israel. So David said to Joab and the commanders of the army, take a census of all the people of Israel from Beersheba in the south to Dan in the north and bring me a report so that I may know how many there are. But Joab replied, May the Lord increase the number of his people a hundred times over. But why, my Lord the King, do you want to do this? Are, are they not all your servants? Why must you cause Israel to sin? But the king insisted that they take the census. So Joab traveled throughout all Israel to count the people. Then he returned to Jerusalem and reported the number of people to David. There were 1,100,000 warriors in all Israel who could handle a sword and 470,000 in Judah. But Joab did not include the tribes of Levi and Benjamin in the census because he was so distressed at what the king had made him do. God was very displeased with the census, and he punished Israel for it. Now, if you read on in this chapter, you'll see that David is convicted of his sin of counting and not trusting the Lord. And he goes before the Lord. God gives him three options. They're all brutal of which punishment he should choose. Now, he could choose between three. David chose the punishment that was from the Lord, hoping for mercy. God sent the angel of death, and he started slaughtering the Israelites. And the angel gets to Israel, and God says, stop. The angel is just about to slaughter Jerusalem. And where he stops is at this guy named Aruna's land. 
And David comes before the Lord and he says, just kill me and all my family and spare the rest of the Israelites, spare Jerusalem. And God says, go to that spot and build an altar to me and apologize. David goes to Aruna's land and he says, I want to buy your land so I can build an altar so that the Lord will stop the punishment. And Aruna's like, take the land. Here's some ox. I'll build the altar. We'll light a big fire. Just, just take it. And that's where God's, that's where David says to Aruna, I will not offer a sacrifice that costs me nothing. He pays the man full price for the land, the ox, the materials for the altar. They build an altar to the Lord and offer a sacrifice, and the curse stops right there. So you remember I'm in doubt mode, right? And I'm like, okay, there's the context. But those seem like they're in direct conflict, direct opposition to each other. Because here in Luke, you're saying count first. And here in Chronicles, you got really mad at David for counting first. Like, what is your word for me, Lord? And he said to me, the common theme is obedience. If I tell you to count first, count first. If I tell you go, go. The point is, be obedient to what I call you to do. So I'm like, oh, that's good. No, that's the word of the Lord. Okay, good. So, okay. So he's like, what did I say to you? What did you guys pray over and agree to? Well, it was very specifically, do whatever it takes to get a waking in the new building. And he's like, does that sound like count or go? I'm like, that sounds like go. It's like, okay, then you're in obedience. You have your confirmation. That's all you need to worry about. Mm, powerful. When we walk in obedience, when we say yes to Jesus, we grow. We become more free. We become alive a little bit more. Jesus said, I have come that they might have life and have it to the full. This definitely includes the area of financial obedience. So, God's word has a lot to say about financial obedience. You may not realize this, but of all the things Jesus talked about, one of the most common subjects was this idea of money and obedience with money. It's very important to God. He knew we'd be reading it someday, and he knew that this would be one of the last things potentially that really come under the lordship of Jesus Christ. Okay, so wherever you are right now, God wants to speak to you from his word. You guys ready to dig into the word a little bit? Yes. Okay, so start in Genesis, Genesis chapter 4, beginning in verse 2. Cain and Abel. When they grew up, Abel became a shepherd, while Cain cultivated the ground. When it was time for the harvest, Cain presented some of his crops as a gift to the Lord. Abel also brought a gift, the best portions of the firstborn lambs from his flock. The Lord accepted Abel and his gift, but he did not accept Cain and his gift. This made Cain very angry, and he looked dejected. Now, I don't want you to gloss over these next verses. This is God literally talking to Cain right now, okay? Why are you so angry? The Lord asked Cain. Why do you look so dejected? You will be accepted if you do what is right. But if you refuse to do what is right, then watch out. Sin is crouching at the door, eager to control you. But you must subdue it and be its master. Question. How many of you, show of hands, are good at mastering sin on your own strength. Yeah. 
So I've tried this a lot in my life. You've heard just like the 40,000th of you that like if I was to really walk you through, you'd just be like, dude, you are such a mess. <laughs> Seriously, you do change your own clothes or I mean, <laughs> it's a miracle. My restoration is a miracle. Sin in my strength kicked my butt. The only way that is possible to master sin, to master, is in the power of Jesus. First brothers, Cain and Abel. Question, who brought a sacrifice? Both of them. Which one did God look on with favor and accept? Abel's. Which one did he reject? Cain's. They both brought a sacrifice. What was the issue? A couple things. Abel brought his first fruits. The first fruits of his lambs and livestock. Cain brought some crops from the field. Abel, second thing, did it with a willing heart. Cain with a bitter heart, obviously. Obviously, he was angry about this. He killed his brother over it. So obviously, he was angry about having to offer a sacrifice. Cain didn't want to share with God, and he's just like, can you imagine the pressure? I really don't want to give, but Abel's building an altar, and I don't want to look bad in front of God. Oh, I'll take some crops. I'll make an offer. But it wasn't his first fruits, and it wasn't with the right attitude. And that was the difference. I want you to understand, for some of you who are more Bible literate, this is before the law and the prophets are written down, right? This happens later. This is the first family. But God's law is before it's written down, it's still God's law. He says, I am the same yesterday, today, and forever. So God had this concept that was best for us called offering my first fruits with a willing heart why does god need anything no the earth is the lord's and everything in it he he's the creator of the universe god needs nothing from us he asks us to offer our first fruits with a willing heart for our good. It's for us. He wants to teach us how to trust him. Because I've discovered this. This is pretty deep spiritual truth here. God, uh, my life, tends to go better when God is in control of it than when I am in control of it. Pretty much 100% of the time. <laughs> and that's what he's wanting to teach us and grow in us. So before the law and the prophets, there's this concept of first fruits with a willing heart. Next scripture is Malachi chapter 3, beginning in verse 8. So something I've shared, Malachi, one of my favorite books of the Bible. <laughs> Go figure. But one of the things I've shared is uh, my parents named me Malachi before they were believers. They were both first generation Christians. They had no idea it was even a book of the Bible. And the powerful thing about that is Malachi in Hebrew means God's messengers. So I believe that God spoke a prophetic word over me and gave me my name before my parents even knew what it meant. Is that not a trip? Yeah. It's cool. It's cool. <laughs> wow. So Malachi chapter 3, verse 8. This is God speaking to the Israelite people through the prophet Malachi. Okay. And he says, should people cheat God? Yet you have cheated me. But you ask, what do you mean? When did we ever cheat you? You have cheated me of the tithes and offerings due to me. You are under a curse, for your whole nation has been cheating you. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse so that there will be enough food in my temple. If you do, says the Lord of heaven's armies, I will open the windows of heaven for you. I will pour out a blessing so great you won't have enough room to take it in. Try it. Put 
need to the test. This concept of tithe means 10%. It's from before law and prophets, as I said. This is the same concept that Abel performed successfully, but Cain didn't. My first fruits, when I earn money, my crops, he wants my first fruits. Bring that first 10% back to me and, and into the storehouse, which is your local church. And you need to understand something. This is not just money in a beautiful bucket. Won't shame the bucket. It's nothing less than an altar before the Lord, okay? When you give your 10%, the first fruits of your earnings back to the Lord through his local church, you are literally building an altar to his name. You are putting this on it, and you are saying, I trust you. Amen. When you do that faithfully, do you see the promise of God in that? What he promises is a blessing more than you can contain. You hear the multiplying effect? If you read God's word very long, you find out when you're obedient, he is not a one-for-one one God, which is totally awesome. He is a multiplying God. He takes your offering and multiplies it. It's amazing. Um, a couple things about that. This verse, he says, God says, test me in this question. In the rest of the Bible, what happens when someone puts God to the test? What? You die. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. N not the passages you usually read to little kids at bedtime. And then they put the Lord their God to the test, and they were no more. Good night, sweetie. <laughs> Sweet dreams. Isn't it? It sh don't get used to the fact that he makes an exception here on the specific topic of offering my first fruits, finances, my stuff to God. He makes an exception right here and says, test me in this and see if I will not open the floodgates of heaven and pour out more blessing than you can possibly contain. Let that sink in. God says things to me over and over again. I don't know about you guys, but one of the things he says to me over and over and over again is, don't fill in the blanks for me. Brothers and sisters, Learn to grow up in your faith to the point where you are no longer filling in the blanks for God and then getting disappointed when he doesn't match what you filled in. He says to me, what are the odds of you guessing correctly what I'm going to do next? And I'm like, uh, pretty much zero. It's like, then why don't you stop? I'm trying to build you up in your faith. Now, faith is being sure of what you hope for and certain of what you do not see. That's what God's word says. I necessarily have to not be able to see everything for my faith to increase. And then when he does come through, I'm like, wow, you did it again. He's like, yeah, I said I would. <laughs> okay, well, I didn't know that's how you're going to do it, but you did it. Don't fill in the blanks for God. That includes when he says, test me in this, and I will pour out more blessing than you can possibly contain. Do not fill in the blanks for God on that promise and then say he didn't fulfill his promise. God is not a vending machine. He knows what you need. And the blessing he chooses to bring back to you when you obey, there will always be a blessing for obedience 100% of the time you do not get to choose what it is because he knows you he knows what's best for you he may decide that scarcity and a gap between your obedience and fulfillment is exactly what you need don't fill in the blanks for God but you can count on the blessing 
Last scripture, Luke chapter 16, verse 13. These are the words of Jesus. No one can serve two masters, for you will hate one and love the other. You will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Do you hear his words in the context of how he structures the sentences? It's one or the other. I have not arrived, okay? I have not arrived. Every day, pretty much, I wake up in the morning and I'm praying to the Lord, I need you. Most of, my, most of my prayers in the morning start out with, I need you and thank you, over and over again. I need you, Lord. Help me to walk in faith, not fear, specifically in the area of finances, of my worry about the gap between what I have and what you will provide, what I've committed to and what's needed, and what you have for me and when. Lord, help me to put it on the altar again this morning and walk in faith. Help me to truly have you as my master, not money. See, being a sixer, it's not about getting somewhere so God can connect with you. It's God meeting you right where you're at right now, wherever you are. And it's about you giving your next yes, Lord, to him. Mm. I don't want to fill in that blank for you. I'm not necessarily here to raise money for a building campaign. God has told me that he will bring the money. He says, I will bring in the difference. Our God is a God of abundance, amen. I don't even, he says if, if, if it doesn't come in any way you're thinking, I'm going to bring it in some crazy way that will absolutely blow your mind. Like some guy who doesn't go to your church stepping up and saying, hey, God told me I'm supposed to do whatever it takes to get you into the new building. Something like that, you know, just theoretically, amen. right? <laughs> so, you, so you see, faith produces faith. You step out in faith. God calls us. We step out in faith. And we're like, okay, Lord, what's, ne you know, what's the next thing you're going to do that's like an only God thing? Amen. He always comes through. I will not fill in the blanks for you. Holy Spirit is speaking to you each individually right now on this point. And I want you to hear what he has to say to you. We've got a little surprise for you. Envelope under your desk, under your chair. Go ahead and pick that up. The Holy Spirit is, I believe, speaking to every one of us. I believe Holy Spirit is always speaking to me. FYI, I just only am uh, actually listening some of the time. <laughs> but I'm pretty sure he's always talking to me. I believe he's speaking to you right now, right where you're at. Some of you on these topics of your first fruits, first 10% to your local church. And warning, once you get faithful with that, he starts calling you into this additional giving and stretching of your time, your talents, your treasures. And he grows your faith. It's beautiful. Do you guys know what the antidote is to selfishness? It's generosity. And nowhere do I struggle with selfishness more than the area of finances. And God consistently uses generosity as the antidote for my selfishness in this area. You can see there's several options on this card. For some of you, it's time to step up and say, I'm going to give the 10%. I'm going to give my first fruits to the Lord here at my local church. For some of you, you're like, ah, uh, I've never even heard this teaching before and you're kind of freaking me out. So is there a baby step option here? 
And so there's a fill in the blank baby step option, which is totally cool. God wants your next yes. Amen. Amen. For some of you, he's calling you to step out in generosity in, a, in an offering that's above and beyond your tithe. And you want to be obedient to that. It may not be here. There may be some person, some circumstance, some other ministry that he is speaking to you about. That's okay. That's awesome. Obey. Obedience is what he's looking for. For some of you, you can see there's an option there where maybe your financial situation is absolutely blown up and you need to just talk to somebody about it and be prayed over. If that's you, then let us know that too. Come up here afterwards. We want to pray for you. God is a God who delivers, brings the dead to life, and restores above and beyond all we can ask or imagine according to his work that is in us. Would you close your eyes for a second? Hmm. Just let God speak to you. What is your next yes in this area of financial obedience? Lord Jesus, we come before you needy. Help us to see what the next yes is. Lord, and we pray, all of us, me included, help us to say the next yes to you, Lord God, and to see that we can trust you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's give it up for Malachi, huh? It's a tough subject. I know, I know God's been speaking to you in this subject because it, it's just all the time in our lives. So let me tell you a story that happened last night. Um, a lady came. Um, by the way, we're going to ask you to fill this out and bring it forward and to make a choice and, and to test God in this. In fact, the next 90 days, if you commit 10% and, it, and you just feel like, it was a big waste of your money. We will give you every dollar back. I promise you. This is not a bill. Like he said, this is, this. we just want financial help. Every staff member that we have at our church gives 10% and then some. And, uh, I, but last night, a lady came to church, and she's been saving up money to get divorced. And she felt like God said to her to give that money and to work on her marriage. Now, I don't know, <laughs> I don't know what, what's going on in, in your life. I know, I remember back in the day in California, a guy came to the altar and gave a big, massive wad of dollars. He was a drug dealer, and he gave it to my dad's church. And it was fun to hear my dad argue about what they should do if they should accept drug money. <laughs> but <laughs> of course they did. But I think uh, <laughs> we're in a marijuana dispensary. If you got money, I mean, this is the last chance to <laughs> spend it here. Um, but I would just, I would like to invite you to, to, to test God in this and to challenge him. We led a prostitute to the Lord in our church. This lady, she gave us a thousand dollar check one day or gave us this money in an envelope. And she said, you have to have this. And we're like, no, like you're broke. You need it. And she goes, no, it's for a car. And then, um, she would not let me give it back to her. And then I said, well, we'll just give it back to you when everything falls apart. She said, no, you won't. Somebody gave her a car. And then the funny part is it had terrible tires. And so she went to the tire factory, and the, the manager at the tire factory gave her all four new tires, just randomly. <laughs> That's why I always buy stuff at the tire factory. And and uh, I, think, I think for us, like, I, I think... In my family, let me tell you, what being rich is in the Kellogg household is not giving 10% to the Lord. That's exciting. That's cool. But for us, it's when we have enough left over to give to the people and the things around us on top of 10%. And by the way, like Malachi said, when you give 10%, what ends up happening is 
you end up giving more. There's no possible way you can't. You can try to just do 10, but it's an addiction. And you realize that this life is, is a story that you're telling. And everybody in your life that you're generous to gives back more than you can even imagine and tells things about you behind your back that you never even know. And so the altar is up. We're going to have you bring this forward. But to make it worse, we're awake and we're a messy church. And I'm just going to be honest with you. When Malachi was talking to me, we were talking about him doing this. God spoke into my heart and said, you need to do an altar call. And I've been so excited about this altar call because I know that there are people in here that need to come and fall here at the altar, not for me or for to prove a great message or anything, but because God wants you to open your hands up and to start new again. And, and so here's the, all, here's the call forward. If you're here today and you've been selfish with your finances. Okay, if you were here today and you had an affair on your wife or you you can fill in the blanks, we would say, hey, come to the altar. And people would come and cry and God would do awesome things. But when have you ever been to a church where they did an altar call on finances? And yet we just read the word, you can't serve two masters. One has to go. And so we are, I'm going to invite you not only to bring an envelope, but if you're here today and you feel God specifically putting it on your heart leaders lead leaders come forward leaders lead with their heart first and set an example for the rest of everybody here and if that's you and god has put this selfishness on your heart or that you may be there it may be small maybe big i'm just this is open so father we just give you this moment right now let us be messy let us be just like who you are jesus do a miracle in this place in jesus name we pray amen by the way, to make matters even worse for our Awaken, we have chosen to give all the money that comes to this service to the building fund. None of this money is going to go into our ministries or anything else. It's going to go to the building fund. And so please, you guys can stand. Let's, let's just take this time. And let's just enjoy God. Let's let God do some miracles in this house. You know what's funny? Every service it's been like this. And it makes me mad because I grew up in a church that felt very judgmental and people were afraid to move. But when God speaks, you need to move. We're not like a normal judgmental place. We are awakened. This is where people find life in Jesus. This is where you live from the inside out. You have to move. I, I want to invite you to move in this area of your life. It's open. We got armed guards if someone tries to steal what you have that you want to bring forward to God. But I'm calling you here. This altar should be full. Take this chance right now. Move. Move for God. Move for what he's speaking into your life. Walk away from the things that are holding back God in your life. This area is open. We have a rock pile here. You can bring the envelopes here. You can come and pray with us here. It's open. Let's do this.
I want to share a story before we we do this. We we don't in our waking when we do funerals, we never have people pay us to do it. Because Daniel always believes that when we do funeral, we don't get paid so that we can preach the gospel. But yesterday, I think they didn't listen to Daniel and they at the funeral home they gave him an envelope with money in it. And Daniel walks to me. And he just gives me the envelope and said, this is yours. Open it. And I was like, uh, okay. I open it. There's money. And I said, why are you giving me this? He said, just, just have it. I said, well, we both did the funeral. Shouldn't you even take half? He said, no, just have it. You, you need stuff for your house. The reason I'm sharing this story is you can never outgive God. I wasn't expecting that. We've never gone to a funeral expecting to be paid. But what happened was my pastor is paid and he turns around and shoves the envelope and gave it to me. I believe God touched his heart to do something awesome. And I want to say this to you. This building will be built with or without you. But I want to say something about our Jesus. When we give him something that he can work with it and you get the blessing. No one can ever outgive our Creator because He owns it all. He owns it all. The giving is not for Him, it's for your heart. Because when Malachi says you can't serve two masters, because if you're not serving God, the money is an idol. And He said, You shall have no other gods before me. So I believe that some people are here right now. You, you're afraid. You didn't step forward because you were afraid. You say, I have nothing to give. But I want to say, yes, you do. 
Because if I look at your pocketbook, I know where your heart is. But if you're here and you say, I need help breaking the chains from the idol of mammon, money. If that's you, I'm going to invite you forward for prayer. I'm not asking you to give. I'm saying, if you need help to break the fear of I'll never make it. God might never come true. That is a life from the pit of hell. And God wants to set you free. This, I just feel it in my heart that there are some people sitting there. And God wants to set you free. Because when you begin to live in generosity, the whole world will know that we serve a God that owns a cattle on a thousand hills. Some of you are there, and I'm going to invite you to come out. This is not a judgmental call. This is not to point at you, but I know some of you need to be set free today. So I'm going to have the worship team kids sing. If that's you, please come forward. We're going to pray, then we're going to end the service. Come on. Don't wait till you see. The Lord knows who you are. This is the moment. He wants to set you free. Some of you are still sitting there, and I know God is talking to you today. Father, Lord, we just want to say thank you. Father, Lord, we say right now, every idol that has taken its place, that has tried to be above you in our hearts, finances, fear, fear of provision, Father, we ask you to break it in Jesus' name. Every, gen every idol and every generational curse of poverty that has held your people that has held them in fear. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we break it in Jesus' name. Father, set us free from fear. Set us free because the Bible says, he that the Son of Man has set free is free indeed. So Father, right now, I say everything holding us from trusting you, we said in Jesus' name, take it off of us in Jesus' name. Everybody say, Amen. Come on. Let's give it up for Jesus. I know you guys. I know it's just a little. Give me one more sec. Are you guys ready? I'm going to ask Malachi and his wife to come forward. Why don't you guys come forward? The other day they prayed for our, I asked uh, a group of a, a River Academy kids came and they prayed for our building. Or I asked them to pray for our building. A teacher prayed and then... It was done, and we went to leave, and his daughter stopped us and said, no, I'm praying. So I want to pray not only for Malachi, but for his amazing girls. Malachi's life is the platform for his girls to go to the next level. And so, and his son, sorry. And so, can we all just, would you all just reach your hands? Let's just pray for Malachi right now and, and his family and, and all that God is going to do in their life. Father, we just pray right now for the Sacitos, Lord. We pray for all of their family, Lord. We pray for all of the connected 